Come on, come on in closer, you guys. As I know, it's like it's good to kind of scrunch in. Yeah. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Choi, the Ramsey County Attorney, and uh, I thank you for being here today because we've got uh, a lot of important uh, things to talk about today, and we've got a lot of speakers, so please uh, bear with us with your patience. But today, uh, you're going to hear uh, from uh, our president of the African American Leadership Council, Tyrone Tyrell, our St. Paul Police Chief, Axel Henry, our Roseville Police Chief, Erica Scheider, who is here, there she is. And uh, we will also hear from uh, Dr. Eric Jolly, who is the president and CEO of the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation. Uh, also uh, here with us today from out of town uh, is um, Jared Fishman and uh, Jess Sorensen from the Justice Innovation Lab at George Washington uh, University. Uh, also from out of town, we have uh, Akai Johnson and Mona Sahaf from the Vera Institute's uh, Reshaping Prosecution Initiative, and of course, uh, our leader in our community, Mayor Carter. Um, also joining us today, and I just want to acknowledge the um, just the the work that's been happening behind the scenes, um, and a, just a special uh, thank you to um, uh, Richard Pittman, who is the president of the St. Paul NAACP. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Um, also uh, with us today is uh, Maplewood Deputy Chief uh, Busack here. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of this today, uh, uh, Deputy Chief. Um, also, we have Nancy Pass, who is here, uh, who is the director of our Emergency Communication Center, and they've had a really critical role, an important role, in helping build out this alternative that you're going to hear about today. And also, too, I want to recognize the presence of uh, Deputy Chief uh, Josh Legault from St. Paul, who has really done a lot of work behind the scenes. I really appreciate all of your work. And then we have also uh, have uh, Don Samuels, who is the founder and creator of the Lights On program, which is a national uh, program uh, that Don uh, founded through um, uh, his organization and also Scott Atkinson from Diversion Solutions. I think I've got everybody here to uh, recognize. But uh, as some of you might recall, back in September of 2021, uh, many of the same people that are assembled here today, we're here uh, to announce a really ch uh, a collective change. Um, this is not about the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. It was a collective change involving the St. Paul Police Department. It was the Roseville Police Department. It was also uh, the Maplewood Police Department, all at the same time in tandem, in unison, uh, standing up and saying that we wanted to make some changes around how we enforce traffic violations, uh, how we thought about non-public safety traffic stops. We wanted to say out loud that we heard uh, the perspectives uh, that have been um, for a lifetime of the perspectives of especially our uh, communities of color, especially the African American community about um, being subjected to these types of non-public safety traffic stops. And we also knew at that time, and we talked about very clearly, the racial disparity that existed between black motorists and white motorists as they were subject to these types of stops, as well as uh, searches. So we announced collectively that we would enact a policy here in my office, uh, a directive in the St. Paul Police Department, uh, Roseville Police Department actually enacted their policy uh, on August 1st, a month before we all stood here today, and connected that work to the broader uh, equity goals of the Roseville City Council. Uh, but we, what we said out loud at that time was that we said that these types of traffic stops, the equipment violations, that they don't really relate to public safety. And so we would like to focus on the things that really matter for our community, which is public safety, the types of traffic stops that really matter, like speeding, impaired driving, reckless driving, careless driving. Those are the types of traffic stops that we should be making in our community. And we said out loud that we wanted to see a shift 
from those non-public safety traffic stops to more of the, the moving violations. And today you're going to see some of that research that would show that indeed, that the things that we worked on collectively, that we decided to pull together on, working together, that these changes have occurred. We also said that at that time that the racial disparity is unacceptable, that we wanted to change that, and that was, it was not a choice. Oftentimes we are told that it's a choice about thinking about racial equity and trying to advance that at the expense of public safety. That is not true. We can actually do both and actually achieve more safety and justice for our community and build a better community. And so we were intentional about saying that out loud. Uh, we also said, and I think oftentimes when we enact reforms across this country, we never build out alternatives. We just make a change and we say that's the change and there's no alternative. And so we knew, knew that we needed to have a way in which we could still enforce the fact that somebody has a broken taillight or they haven't paid their license tabs. And so through the generosity of uh, the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation, uh, we were able to build out that alternative, working with the ECC and Nancy Pass and her, her organization uh, to build a way that we could build out an alternative so that officers could record that information, put people on notice, then ultimately help people with the defective equipment violation or helping people with paying back their license tabs. And we said out loud that if we could do those things, that we think that we could create a better version of justice and safety for a community. And we had a lot of people that were up here talking about that vision. Well, today, I'm just so proud to tell you uh, that I think all indications are we're moving in the right direction and that we have not in any way negatively impacted public safety. I think I said out loud that if this initiative would lead to lesser safety for all us, that we wouldn't be doing this. And we actually think it improves uh, the police community relations, which is so critical, especially today. And so uh, today, uh, you're going to hear from a number of people talking about their piece of this um, change and reform and the work that has happened behind the scenes. This was not easy work. And I really want a, a special uh, shout out to our police chiefs here who had to um, have some tough conversations, like I did, uh, within their own organizations as well as with our community to explain what it is that we're doing. Because it's not always easy to explain these things when we uh, things can seem or feel controversial. But today I'm hoping to let the air out of some of that controversy because we want to be transparent and we want to show the data, we want to show the research. And that's why we have uh, the Justice Innovation Lab uh, here today to talk a little bit about it at a high, very high level. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. <laughs> Uh, Tyrone Terrell, uh, the president of our African American Leadership Council. I think some of you, if you were here at the last press conference, um, there was a reporter sitting right where Matt Sepik was sitting, and she uh, read out loud some of the pushback that we were getting immediately on this topic. And I answered the question as best I could, but then uh, my friend Tyrone Terrell could not resist, and he, <laughs> and he grabbed the microphone, and he said something that was profound. Uh, that something that all of our community really needs to be thinking about, that um, it's the community uh, that's most impacted by all of this, the violence, the crime, um, that we should listen to them. And so with that, I'm going to have Tyrone come on up here and talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Again, my name is Tyrone Terrell, President of the African American Leadership Council. And I want to thank John uh, and his team, but all the law enforcement folks, uh, of course the mayor, because um, as a former human rights director for this city for 12 years, I consider this a human rights policy. Um, I was with a group of about 25 young African American men and I told them about this policy. And one guy said to me, this just saved my life. I said, what do you mean? And he said, because I don't drive my car sometimes because the tail lights out or something doesn't work on my car. And I get nervous and get worried 
anytime there is a cop car close to me. I get worried about being stopped just for that. And so this is a major policy change. Um, and not just for the black community, but for all communities. But as I said the last time we were here, um, we are the most policed community. We are the most criminalized community. But we also are a community that wants law enforcement. We want it, we need it. And so I agree with John, this allows our police officers to focus on crimes that are really impacting our community. Not somebody's tail light, not their tenant windows, not their tabs not being paid, not their cross or air freshener hanging from their mirror, but to focus on real crimes in our community. So I am honored to be here today. Uh, I'm proud to be here today. Uh, this is sending St. Paul um, in the right direction, a direction that um, uh, I've heard our mayor say for years is the most, is the most livable city in, the, in America. That's right. That this puts us even more in that direction for all people because when you don't have to worry about being pulled over for minor violations, then everybody's gonna be safer. So again, John, everybody, all the officers, the mayor, thank you. Thank you, Tyrone. So our next speaker is our uh, police chief uh, in St. Paul, Axel Henry. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I really wanna just uh, reemphasize uh, what uh, the Rams County Attorney John Choi said. Uh, when I watched this press conference on the launch, um, you know, over 18 months ago, uh, I had the exact same response as not only as a police officer, um, but as a resident of the city. Uh, and when Tyrone Terrell said those words, why won't you willing just give this a try? Because it's our community that's getting affected by it the most. I said that was the most profound thing that was said during that entire conversation. Um, our police department is committed to working with the community. Uh, we are constantly having conversations with our community about every aspect of what we do. Um, we were meeting with both internally and externally um, as a department, but also as a community members uh, to figure out what we wanted to do and how we wanted to approach this. And I, I'll be honest with you, I, I think it's just as simple as this. If we're gonna spend time and resources out trying to make our community safer, and we have time to make 100 traffic stops today, it's really just this easy. What do you want people stopping people for? And I can tell you, as much as there are always difficult conversations, I think most of that stems from people being misunderstood, our officers do not want to write tickets for broken taillights. They'd much rather see you get your taillights fixed. They don't want to write tickets for no, no insurance. They'd rather see you get insurance. Um, we, our goal in St. Paul is we want valid, insured, and, and safely equipped drivers out there on the road so they can go to work, they can go to their recreation, they can go to the gym, they can go to wherever they're going and not have to worry about little things. Uh, we're committed to working with our community uh, and this is what together looks like. This is what it looks like when we come together and we decide how we're going to police our city. I always tell folks there should be a little apostrophe S after St. Paul on my patch. Because I'm not just the St. Paul police, we're St. Paul's police. We're the community's police department. And if you can't be that if you're not listening, you're not talking, you're not trying to do things to make it better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chief. Uh, next, I would like to call up uh, Chief Erica Scheider from Roseville. Thank you so much, Chief. Good afternoon. As he said, I'm Erica Scheider, the chief for the Roseville Police Department. Starting back in 2017, the Roseville Police Department began prioritizing enforcement of moving violations. And this came after a series of community conversations where we heard that these stops were disproportionately uh, affecting communities of color. Over the past few years, we've continued to hear from our community and especially from our multicultural advisory committee that traffic stops based solely on minor equipment violations erode trust within the, for the people that we serve and ultimately undermine our legitimacy. In January 2023, I'm excited to announce that we had launched a new pilot program, Letters Instead of Tickets. When a Roseville police officer sees a minor equipment violation, they've got the option of quickly entering that information into the computer. All they need to enter is the license plate number and then a drop down of what the uh, violation is. The rest of the data is now auto uh, populated through the system including the location um, owner or officer's name. For the patrol officer, this can take less than 20 seconds. The owner of the vehicle is then mailed a violation letter advising them of the violation 
and more importantly, giving them options to get that violation fixed. Since the program uh, launched in January of 2023, we've mailed over 1,500 letters. The letters educate the owners and then help them remedy the uh, issue by either coming to the police department to pick up a lights on voucher or also providing financial assistance for tabs. I also wanna note that the only officer's time is that 20 seconds to enter that information quickly. The rest of the time is through volunteers, interns, and what's so key, uh, crucial with this is it frees up our officers to be on the streets fighting crime and focusing on the priorities of our community. By continuing to focus our traffic enforcement on moving violations, officers have more time to focus on driving conduct that's endangering our public. Things like distracted driving, excessive speed, and impaired driving. It allows our officers to prioritize more time to fight violent crime, which remains our top priority in our community of Roseville. I just wanna take a couple minutes to quick thank uh, Lights On, Diversion Solutions, the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation, the uh, ECC, and also the Ramsey County's Attorney's Office for making this pilot program possible and for creating an alternative here in Ramsey County. Uh, thank you, Chief. And um, I should also say before I call up uh, Dr. Jolly, uh, who um, through the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation created a Ramsey County Public Safety Fund that helped you know, fund the research and fund the alternatives, that um, the city of Maplewood will also be embarking on utilizing this alternative. Uh, so they'll start that process up. And through the generosity of the foundation, we have found them some clerical resources so that we can get these letters out, not only for Maplewood, uh, but for other participating communities in our county. And I just recently had a meeting with the suburban police chiefs, and I really think that all of them will take up uh, this alternative. Um, regardless of whether or not you have a policy or a change, the alternative, the existence of it, I think in and of itself can actually uh, breed some good uh, changes as well. So Dr. Jolly, I just wanted to say this publicly that um, uh, you, um, from the moment that you heard about this vision uh, about a better version of justice and fairness and policing in our community, uh, you just jumped at the opportunity to be of assistance and to be a leader amongst the philanthropy community to create that fund. Uh, it really made a huge difference around uh, the research that we're gonna be able to hear about um, when uh, Jared Fishman comes up here to fund that, to fund the alternative. Um, I just have, from the bottom of my heart, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, everyone, including the storytellers of the press because we need our community to hear this kind of story. The St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation invest in community-led solutions. And then we commit to helping sustain those with evidence of impact and change that helps improve the quality of life and make this a vibrant Minnesota in which all of our citizens thrive. This program shows creativity, ingenuity, cooperation, and commitment across all sectors of our community to tell a different story, to create a different outcome. When you meet with the programs of Diversion Solution and Lights On, you begin to see people become softer, become gentler, begin to realize that the system they're about to meet isn't something they should fear, but one that will work with them. And that's what our police department is doing. That's what all of our systems are doing through this project. We're putting together a very different story with something as small as the assistance to correct a broken taillight and other things. We're showing people that the community cares and is invested in their quality of life. And what I love best is the research. Good research and good data organizes a knowledge fact base. It predicts the generation of our future data and knowledge facts. And it tells in some aesthetic sense the story of the whole. Good data is a good story and we have good data to show that this solution works and that it works across communities in a variety of settings to assure the safety of our officers, 
and our community, but even more to strengthen the bonds between our community and the systems that they've helped to build. Thanks everyone for making this happen. Thank you, Dr. Jolly. And next I'd like to call up um, Jared Fishman, who is the Executive Director of the Justice Innovation Lab at George Washington University to talk about some of that research and data. Thank you, John. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Jared Fishman. I am the Executive Director of Justice Innovation Lab, uh, an organization that works with prosecutors and police departments around the country to build a more equitable and effective justice system. Before that, I spent 14 years as a prosecutor at the U.S. Department of Justice, where I investigated hate crimes, human trafficking, and police misconduct. I'm excited to be here in Ramsey County today for the release of this important report, important report and I want to start by talking about why this report matters. In America today, traffic stops are the primary way that police officers interact with the communities that they served. And nationwide, it's estimated that 20 million traffic stops happen every year. In Ramsey County alone, in the four-year period that this report covers, there were approximately 200,000 of these community police interactions. And anyone who's ever been pulled over, which I imagine is virtually everyone here, can attest that these interactions can be stressful at, at a minimum and inconvenient. The tickets that can come out of these interactions can create debilitating financial penalties. And the burden has been disproportionately borne by people of color. Black drivers are four times more likely to be pulled over and nine times more likely to be searched. But we also know that far too often these interactions can turn deadly for both civilians and for law enforcement. Since 2017, at least 800 people have been killed in interactions that began with the traffic stop. Over the course of my career, I watched more videos than I care to count of both civilians and police officers being killed during these interactions. And so given the deadly nature of these interactions, we might expect that they would be a very good way for us to get guns off the street. But when we look at the numbers, what we see is that police recover guns less than 1% of the times, which in my opinion is a rather poor return on investment for public safety in our communities. And among the most problematic of these traffic stops, are stops for non-public safety reasons, such as expired tags or equipment failures. They're problematic in part because they disproportionately fall on lower income communities of color. And not surprisingly, the citizens who endure those stops are likely to have a strong distrust of law enforcement. I can tell you from personal experience, this distrust caused significant problems for both the police and prosecutors who struggle to gain cooperation of both victims and witnesses in crimes. But I'm here today because this jurisdiction decided to do something different. They wanted to know, could we reduce the number of traffic stops for non-public safety reasons, such as broken taillights and expired tags, without impacting crime? In 2021, as you've heard, the county attorney's office, along with the police departments represented here, decided that they were going to try to minimize these uh, windshield uh, stops for things like broken taillights and windshield damage. Vera Institute assisted in this endeavor. Justice Innovation Lab, the organization that I lead, was asked to come in and analyze the impact of these decisions and these new policies. And for those of you who have not had a chance to read the report yet, spoiler alert, it's great news. The policy is working. The number of non-public safety stops uh, have been reduced by 86% and searches reduced by 92%. There were over 6,000 fewer traffic stops for non-public safety reasons. All racial groups in this city and in this county saw dramatic decreases in these stops. But in addition, racial disproportionalities and traffic stops dropped too, including a 66% drop for black drivers with searches down 85%. As a percentage of all traffic stops, non-public safety stops have been reduced dramatically, down to less than 5% of stops. And all of this was done without negatively impacting public safety there was no appreciable change in the number of weapons that were seized. And yet, as excited as I am about these results, I recognize that this is only the first step. Disproportionalities have not ended. Drivers of color are still far more likely to be stopped and searched than white drivers. We haven't solved the problem yet, but we've taken a vital first step. Fixing the problems that all communities face will take time, and there's absolutely more that we can do about it. But I'm excited to be in Ramsey County and look forward to seeing the changes that this community will take. 
and of course, uh, all of the data and research uh, will be put online. Uh, the Justice Innovation Lab will be launching a website uh, with all of this information so that people in our community can take a really closer look to see that indeed uh, the disparities have uh, dramatically been reduced um, with respect to these types of stops. Um, our next speaker uh, is Akai Johnson uh, with the Vera Institute. Um, through their reshaping prosecution uh, initiative. And um, Kai, come on up here, but I just want to thank uh, the, the Vera Institute for all the technical assistance uh, that you provided for me in terms of the thinking about around all of this and the challenge that you put out to us uh, to make uh, these changes in our community. And I want to thank you also for all the work that you're doing across the country. Thank you, John, and happy to be here. As John just referenced, our team works with prosecutors around the country interested in criminal justice reform. And in 2019, we were in a room full of uh, elected prosecutors, and we were talking about these types of policies because of how important they are for safety and justice. And we went around the room to everybody there and asked them, would you be interested in taking this policy on? And um, there were a lot of uh, uh, silent faces um, and not a lot of comments until we got to John. Um, near the end, and he leaned back and crossed his arms and had this pensive look that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, and he said, you know, I, I am interested. Um, I think this is the right thing to do, but I want to talk to people in my community first and see how they feel, and I want to talk to my law enforcement partners. And two years after that, um, we were at this press conference with John and all of his law enforcement partners because they had the courage to do something that was hard but necessary. Um, this is a policy that is truly designed to make sure that everyone feels safe, no matter your skin color, your language, um, what country you're from, no matter how much money you have in your pocket, it recognizes that everyone deserves to feel safe. And as a former prosecutor, I know how hard it can be for people to make this change because we're trained that these stops are truly necessary for public safety, but that's just not what we see in the data. Um, nationwide, we see study after study that traffic stops generally only lead to the recovery of guns or drugs or other evidence roughly between 2 and 5 percent of the time. So that means, in other words, that over 95 percent of these traffic stops are not leading to the recovery of evidence um, that's related to public safety. But as speakers here have hinted, um, that's not the end of it because these stops disproportionately impact black and brown people and people from otherwise marginalized communities. And there's been research done to separate two different types of stops. So one is kind of must stops, reckless driving, DUI, speeding, and then can stop situations, which are these non-public safety stops, dark window tint, um, something hanging from your rear view mirror. And we find that racial disparities are much higher in the can stop situations. And that's particularly detrimental for public safety for all the reasons people are familiar with, but also because it erodes trust. If you get pulled over for speeding, you get it. You know you were doing something wrong. You know the police were going to pull you over. But if you get pulled over for something like an air freshener hanging from your rearview mirror, you are much less likely to trust law enforcement. And even there's been more recent research that you're much less likely to engage civically, even less likely to turn out to vote. So policies like this are so crucial to deter all of these effects. And one other point we see from data that doesn't get a lot of attention is that traffic stops can actually be dangerous for officers as well. Of all the ways that officers are harmed when they initiate activity, traffic stops are at the top of that list. So ultimately, these stops don't make us safer, they drive racial disparities, and they unnecessarily put officers in harm's way. So it's so exciting to see Ramsey County join now five prosecution offices that have adopted similar policies, 10 police agencies that are exploring this around the country, and 11 legislative bodies around the country that have all taken this step. But what's unique here is the cooperation we see between a prosecutor's office, law enforcement officers, community partners, instead of the typical blame game of, oh, it's your fault that crime is rising, or it's the police department's fault, or it's the prosecutor's fault. Instead, we see everyone here coming together to really model a solution that we think can work anywhere in the country. Thank you, Akai, and it's so true. Um, if we can all start pulling together in the same direction, uh, we can do a lot of great things. And speaking of doing great things, um, I want to invite uh, our mayor, uh, Melvin Carter, to the stage. Thank you, sir. 
Good uh, afternoon, and thank you all for being here. And I want to just uh, echo uh, all of the uh, applause and thanks for all of the project partners uh, who have helped make this work work. I heard our police chief say something very critical today, uh, and that is that apostrophe S, that the St. Paul Police Department is very much more accurately St. Paul's Police Department. Uh, the job of our officers, and I say that uh, inclusively, as we've heard uh, of the work in, in, in Roseville and uh, across the county as well, the job of our officers is to help facilitate safer outcomes for all of us. One of the truths I think we've found ourselves face to face with, particularly in the last couple of years, is a truth that I've grown up with all of my life. And that is that there are some people in every community, ours included, who feel confident that the men and women in uniform are here to protect their safety. And there are some people in every community who wake up every morning concerned that maybe uh, they're here to enforce me and keep me away from someone as opposed to help me stay connected to the prosperity that exists in our community. As a young person who grew up in this city, believe me, I can tell you stories of being pulled over personally for those equipment violations, uh, for those can stops uh, that we were just uh, hearing about, as opposed to those must stops. And I can tell you personally about the story of uh, the, the, the questions that bring to mind about trust and the concerns that that can bring to mind about confidence. And we all know that one of the tenets, one of the core tenets of policing in America is the belief that the, 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 the credibility, uh, that the confidence, that the relationships between our community members and the officers who protect and serve us is really our fundamentally strongest public safety asset. So this intervention really is about uh, protecting public safety. This intervention is about keeping our officers safe. This intervention is about what we call in St. Paul our community first public safety framework. When I was first running for mayor, we launched our community first public safety framework that said simply that you know public safety can't start after a crime is committed, after someone has called 911, after an emergency has happened. Public safety has to start with us identifying all of the cycles that we can and identifying ways to interrupt those cycles proactively before something terrible has happened. So as you hear that story, that traffic stops are commonly one of the most uh, common ways that police officers become endangered themselves, we're breaking that cycle. As you hear the story that those can stops, those, uh, those, those non-public safety related stops uh, are, are, are uh, such a detriment to community trust and, and that trust is critical to making sure that community members participate, that community members offer support, that community members bring information voluntarily. We're breaking that cycle. Moreover, a lot of what our community first public safety framework is about and I want to thank, you know, just a couple of years ago, we launched our Community First Public Safety Commission in St. Paul uh, to ask these types of questions. And one of the strongest recommendation, recommendations that they brought back was that we look closely at non-public safety stops and how our officers relate to them and how we end them in St. Paul. And uh, that's what got the ball rolling toward uh, us making this policy change as re with, re with regard to the St. Paul uh, Police Department. Uh, I want to acknowledge Akua Ellis and John Marshall, who are not here today, but who are the co-chairs of that work uh, with us here. One of the things that we find very quickly is a lot of this suite of work is about freeing our officers to do the things, to do the work, to make the stops, to investigate in the ways that many of us wake up in the morning thinking and assuming they're doing in the first place. Over these past couple of years in St. Paul, we have gone from less than 70% of our traffic stops being for moving violations. The type of things that actually make us all less safe, when someone's speeding, when someone's driving recklessly, et cetera, those are the types of things that make us all less safe. And just a couple of years ago, there were less than 70% of our traffic stops here in St. Paul. Today, Chief, they're over 90%, 93% 93 
of our traffic stops in St. Paul are about those things that make our community members safer. It saves time for officers. It frees up officer and department capacity to focus on making us safer, to focus on fighting violent crime, to focus on being the types of police officers that we all know that our community expects and deserves. I, I, I thank the St. Paul Police Department for being the leader that we always are. I applaud Roseville for stepping up to the plate in the way that you are, and I certainly thank you, County Attorney John Choi, for keeping uh, our whole county on the cutting edge of such critical policy. Thank you all. Thank you, Mayor. Dennis, I so, think it's... Uh, Luke, time for questions, and Luke, let's jump into it. Okay, so for Mr. Choi and or maybe both, uh, Chief Henry, I believe that investigative stops are up, Mm -hmm. and pretextual stops are down. Can you help explain how you think the public should interpret that? I think it's a good thing. I mean, can when you can you're... Can explain what it means, too? Like right, so an investigative stop is when a police officer has, they're conducting an investigation and they have reasons that they can actually articulate in a police report about if something, about why they stopped and that there's certainly nothing wrong with the constitutional issues. That would be like an investigative stop. Now. Uh, a pretextual stop uh, that you just referenced, um, how that would be understood is when, like for instance, oftentimes how this might play out in this country is that if you observe somebody with a, 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 an equipment violation, like a, something hanging from your rear view mirror, uh, you are legally entitled to pull that person over and ask some more questions, conduct additional type of investigation. But as we have all talked about, that type of stop does not lead to um, actually the recovery of contraband. Uh, from a percentage perspective, it's very, very, very low. And so that would be the difference. I don't know, Chief Henry, if you wanted to talk about that, but it's a good thing. Because aren't the investigative stops still recovering guns and stuff? I mean, a lot of the, the fear about this uh, policy when it went into effect is all of a sudden there's going to be all these illegal guns that are not being found. Right, and the researchers looked at that and they couldn't conclude that somehow that that's true. Yeah, and that, uh, <coughs> so just contextually to think about it, um, if uh, your neighbor's garage gets burglarized and uh, they come out in the middle of the night and the car goes drive down the alley and it's a black van with a white replacement door in the back so it stands out. Um, and they didn't get a license plate, <clears throat> they don't know about any equipment violations, but it's a black van with a white door in the back. The following night, someone calls and says, there's a car in my alley, it's a black van with a white panel door on it, and I think they just broke into my neighbor, my other neighbor's garage. And the officers know about this. They have enough, now, information to stop that man. They don't need an equipment violation or any of those types of things. That would be an investigative stop. And we are interrupting crimes in our city that way. We are recovering uh, firearms that way. Uh, but we're, there's all kinds of things that happen on those. Those things are still there. We haven't seen a huge spike in those. They're not like we're turning one stop into another kind of a thing. But we're allowed to do that uh, by, you know, by, by law, and that's something that still happens, and yes, we do interrupt crimes that way. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Matt, Chief, uh, what are you hearing from the rank and file in your department about this new policy? Uh, I think, um, well, uh, they, they support it, they like it. In fact, most of our officers don't like writing tickets for things you could rather spend your money getting fixed. They don't want to be the, kind of the bully in the neighborhood. Uh, in fact, one of the things we've heard negatively is that they actually really enjoyed having interactions with community members where they would pull someone over and say, hey, I'm not here to give you a ticket. I just want to let you know your taillights are out and actually get to hand off those vouchers. I know I personally have been hugged and thanked over and over again for handing off those vouchers. That interaction, they miss that. Um, but I think more reflectively is, is that we're seeing this year now as we get our staffing, we're working on our staffing things, um, that our stops are actually starting to go up and up and up and the compliance or the directive of the stops has actually increased. So those percentages are improving even more towards moving violation things at 93% uh, year to date so far. And we're almost at the number of tra traffic stops this year that we made all of last year. So that lets me know that they're out stopping, they're out doing tra the traffic enforcement and they're doing the type that their community and the department has asked them to do. Also for the chief, what kind of conversations then do you have with neighboring departments who have not done this yet? I mean, are, are you just talking to them to say, to share your results and, and your anecdotal experiences? Well, I think that's kind of the purpose of this very 
this very report is to have those things. I mean, I don't, I, I, I would never assume to go tell someone else how to run their, their department, just like I would never let someone come in and say, well, you need to do in your community what we do in our community because our community is here with us. Our community, we're talking all the time. Uh, and so I would encourage any chief or any leader in any community to have conversations with their community, and that means everyone in the community, not just people that are going to echo back your, your beliefs to you. Um, but I'm not out pushing a political agenda on this. I, we have a, a city and a police department to run, so. Would they have any of those come to you to find out your experience? Uh, not at this point, but I think that this uh, today's event will probably open up some of the gates for that for people to, have to ask those questions, and I welcome those conversations. Maplewood, Roseville, St. Paul, are those the only agencies involved uh, in this project at this point? Well, the, the researchers uh, looked at uh, agencies that actually did something tangible, right? So the, the, the list of the agencies would be St. Anthony Village. And they had uh, done a number of things to shift from uh, more to moving violations in the wake of uh, uh, Philando Castile. And then um, St. Paul, which, uh, as the chief talked about, uh, issued out a directive via email, and then a number of conver subsequent conversations. Maplewood, uh, which did the, pretty much the same thing that St. Paul did. Um, and then Roseville, and I had mentioned Roseville. Uh, they actually, I think, were the first agency in the state of Minnesota to actually enact this change, which was back on August 1st. Uh, and, uh, and of course, as the chief said, some of that work even predated the August 1st. But what they did was they, um, and a shout out to the, the city of Roseville, but they connected this policy change to the city's broader uh, racial equity goals, which I also thought was very um, uh, courageous on their part. And is the sheriff's office at all involved in, in any of this in Ramsey County? Um, I think the good news out of, because I think nothing ever changes unless you um, develop relationships, you have conversations, and you start developing trust. Uh, I would like to believe and hope that because now we have this alternative uh, that is in place, and it's working really well in Roseville and in St. Paul, uh, we offered this out to everybody in the county, and uh, it's my hope and belief that all of the agencies will take us up on that, because I think just the alternative, just using the alternative, whether or not you have like a directive or a policy, can actually also make a difference. And I can also, as I mentioned before, uh, we have found resources for the city of Maplewood to hire a clerical staff to work on these letters, not just for Maplewood, but also for North St. Paul, which is a community that's now going to be uh, making some changes, and then others who, are, who might be willing. So those conversations are just starting, uh, but uh, I approach this as a, just an open invitation. I will meet people where they're at, and I've never told people to do whatever. They should do whatever they think their community wants them to do, but I have a, an openness of you know, working with everybody, and I want to make sure that we uh, are doing the right thing to create a better version of policing and uh, a justice system that's actually worthy of its name. So Mr. Choi, just explaining the policy in action over the last year, there were some instances where a low level drug charge was declined because it was because it came from a pretextual stop. There also was a couple where a gun charge was prosecuted that came up. Can you explain the difference and, and why that is? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So uh, we also, are, and we will include this in all of the data that we are releasing today so everybody can take a look at it, but we had a total of 12 cases in which some police agency in Ramsey County or maybe a police agency that, like the state patrol, presented us a case for us to prosecute, uh, but the policy was implicated because the reason that they found the contraband, meaning it could be drugs or it could be guns or whatever it might have been, right, originated from that non-public safety traffic stop. That was the only probable cause to have pulled them over to begin with. So we received 12 of those cases in which we said that, that yes, this is within our policy. Now, of course, 
we have a public safety exception in that policy. If the police officer articulates to us about how important it is that this person um, is charged with this particular crime, we will, we've been developing out kind of what that public safety exception means. And so of those 12 cases, right, only, uh, or nine of them, uh, nine of those cases were declined per the policy. In three of those cases, we actually prosecuted because we felt that it felt within the public safety exception. Those three cases, one involved uh, the, the equipment violation was a windshield uh, violation, but uh, there was a, the charge was for fleeing police. We felt that there was a public safety issue there, and we were really glad that the police caught them because if we didn't catch them, uh, it would have been another unsolved um, uh, auto theft. Um, and then th with regard to uh, the other case, it was uh, a case involving uh, where we prosecuted. It was somebody who uh, was in possession of uh, uh, narcotics and illegal possession of a handgun, an ineligible person. Uh, the third case was another ineligible person with a handgun. The rest of the cases, um, for, the, were the, for the most part, uh, what the contraband was, was for drugs except for in one instance it was uh, an illegal uh, carrying of a rifle, uh, I believe in the back seat. But some of those cases were actually prosecuted by the city attorney. So just because we might have refused it per the policy, um, the police may have presented it to the city attorney for lesser charges. And in, and in at least one, two, three of those cases of the nine, the city attorney did prosecute that case, including the carrying of the, uh, the, the rifle. Um, and yeah, so that's the, the data. Now, th all of this information will be up on the website, but just keep in mind, we enacted these changes since September 8th of 2021, right? So during that time period, there's just a total of 12 cases. I don't think that that's a lot. And that's what we said, someone had asked that question back in 2021, what are we talking about? How many cases are we talking about? We said, well, we don't know for a fact, but we'll start tracking it, but we anecdotally believe it's just a few small handful. In those second two cases, point of clarification, what, what, what were the persons pulled over for? Uh, in which we prosecuted? Yeah, you said one involved a windshield violation, and then... Then that was the flee, we charged for fleeing police. The, the one with, uh, well, both of them were in, in, ultimately involving uh, having a handgun without a permit. Um, so the, it was a, one of them was uh, out of Moundsview. It was a registration violation, so a tabs issue. And then the, the other one was out of St. Paul, which we prosecuted, and that was a window tint. And that came in, in on the January of 2022. Well, I think there's a lot of things. I mean, first of all, I, I don't think that um, a lot of people in our community at this moment in time, and you can help us with this, is to share uh, the story and the data and the research. And then my hope is, is that we have more conversations about how we uh, continue to improve um, the working relationship and trust. Uh, you know, a police officer are actually a part of our community and we gotta get that right. You know, it just pains me to know that, um, you know, police are struggling right now with um, recruiting, retention. Um, what, the what the community has been saying is that we just want a better version of it. I believe the vast, vast majority are saying that we want, we need police. We just have to make sure that we have enough police and we need to have a better version of it. And these leaders here are leading agencies that are every day evolving and connecting to their community and delivering, I think, a better version of policing. And at the end of the day, it also relates to the work that happens in the prosecutor's office, in our court systems. Um, and it's an ongoing conversation and improvement, but I think that's my biggest hope is that this data and this research and what we're talking about today generates further conversations. I hope that people across our region and our state and our country are paying attention because um, I think there's something unique and important about what's happening here today in terms of how we're doing this is that we're doing it together. Let's do one last question. And we'll okay. It was sort of alludes to the, the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department, obviously the sheriff is not here. As the county attorney or the mayor, or 
can you No, I mean, Sheriff Fletcher is an independently elected official, and I think he should do what he thinks the community wants him to do. I hope that he'll be paying attention to this and think about this in a thoughtful way. I will continue to have conversations with him. Um, uh, so it's a, this is a, a journey, and I think we should meet people where they're at, and let's continue to have those conversations. Thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks for I'll say one more thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I do think it's important, and this is one of the reasons why having data like this is very critical. Everyone agrees that public safety is our number one job. There are some people who say that en route to saying we should not innovate, that it's too important to innovate around. And there are some folks who say it's too important not to innovate around public safety. That if, if, if this is our number one job, then continuing to do it in the exact same way we did it in decades and generations past just isn't good enough. Having data like this is so important. Just two years ago, we were talking about rumors and anecdotes. Today, we get to have a conversation around data and tangible results. Our hope is not only that uh, uh, department leaders will step up, uh, like our two chiefs who are here today already have, but that community members will be able to see this and be able to say, yes, this is the type of approach to public safety that we know that we deserve in St. Paul, in Ramsey County, in Roseville, in Maplewood, in our East Metro, in Minnesota, in our country, and be able to demonstrate that because we're showing that these, these policies are having the desired effects, that they are having the impacts that we expected them to have, it gives us a way, it gives us an opportunity to get away from economic policing those uh, equipment violations, of course someone who is lower income is more likely to not have been able to fix that tail light. Of course someone who is lower income is going to be more likely to have an older and less expensive vehicle and not be able to maybe keep up with some of those maintenance issues. And it gives us an opportunity to move strongly toward real public safety policing, which is what our communities desire and demand. And our expectation, uh, my, I fully expect, our community members, our constituents in Ramsey County, across our city, across our East Metro, to look at this and say, yes, these are the type of outcomes that we want in our law enforcement uh, and lead from community. And a link to that study, to the mayor's just reference, is coming your way inside of 45 minutes, along with everything else we talk about here. So I want to thank everyone up here, and of course, thank all of you for taking the time to come out and talk to us about this. Thank you. Well done, sir. Well, that was just, it was just delicately done. Yeah. What's the most 